How did I actually know? Oh, there you go. No, you have to it. All right, and we're recording in progress. So, welcome everyone to what is the first program in a long time where we actually some of us physically present together. Welcome to the first program of what is almost the new year of the Israel Committee. And it's, of course, a joint program of the Social Justice Committee, formerly known as the Social Action Committee. Um, I'm Mark Schoenfield, co chair of the Israel Committee. With me is Zach Self, who is co chair and will be handling the QA. Um, Lisa Levine is probably somewhere on the Zoom, uh, who's the chairperson of Social Justice. And we're all very happy that you're here with us tonight. Um, the mission of the Israel Committee is to bring balanced programming to Beth Emma. So the upcoming programs will include um, talking about the midterm election. United States, the election in Israel, what it all means for Israel, talking about the literature of the, one of the more renowned novelists in Israel and what it meant, not only as literature, but what it tells us about life on the kibbutz, um, women's equality, struggle in Israel, and a host of subjects that we'll be bringing to you. Um, tonight we're going to start though with one that's rarely in the news, but really ought to be, you know. Um, too often, all we hear about are things that involve um, violence and strife, and we don't hear about the parts of Israel that don't involve violence and strife nearly as often, especially in the news. So tonight, what we're going to be hearing about is how does Israel, both the government and NGOs, aid marginalized communities in the United States? It's quite a story, and it's a story that basically few of us really know. Asaf Grumberg, is the Midwest Executive Director of Stand With Us, um, and is here with us tonight. He was voted one of the more important Jewish professionals, or one of the most important 36 Jewish professionals under the age of 36 when he was younger. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned tonight, though, that he's not new to Beth Emmett, that actually his children attended Beth Emmett, and his wife taught here, and as soon as we walk in, he and Becky are like old friends. Um, before we start, though, the other thing I want to do is I want to thank Becky for all her help with programming, Jeff, who's here tonight, for his help in getting the whole thing set up, Aviva for her help with publicity, um, and all of you who showed up tonight. So, Asaf, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. I'll still, uh, I'll keep a safe distance still. <laughs> Hey, let me, um, is this better? Can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, hi everyone here and at home. I appreciate everyone's time joining us. Okay, it's working. Perfect. I appreciate everyone's time joining us uh, this evening to discuss this topic. And it's a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, as an Israeli who's lived in the States for, for 12 years now, um, I've seen a lot of the work that's that's done by Israelis outside of the, the Israeli government and the IDF, and we're going to mention that a little bit, but truly really about the work that's been done by Israelis, individuals, private citizens who care about working and helping people around the world. That that's really something I want to highlight, and I appreciate the committee uh, and Beth Emmett, of course, having me here tonight for this conversation. So we're going to talk a little bit about this and. I think at first I want to talk about the, the, the why. why. Why are Israelis doing it? Why is the Israeli government doing it? And I, you know, not that they've given me the answer, but I really think that it has a lot to do with the idea that we, you know, we want to save souls around the world with the, the concept that has you know, become tikkun olam and for so many hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of years were about saving one soul as if you've saved the entire planet. Um, and I really think it's something that sticks with the community in, in Israel. Israelis come, or the, the, the state of Israel, and this kind of the, the, the idea of the creation of the state of Israel comes from a long passage of, of persecution. And we all know that in 1948, Israel was at the end of, of, the, of the diaspora of 2000 years um, and the creation of the modern state of Israel. And these Jewish people who came into the state of Israel really felt like we need to take everything that we've learned and everything that has been done to us and utilize this. And so 
in my eyes, that really what, what that is. It's really about taking the, the knowledge that we've created over the last 100 years and helping others around the world really with, with our, our experience. So we're going to divide tonight's program into two parts. Once we're going to start talking first about the official assistant, government assistance through the, the foreign ministry in Israel and through the IDF. And then we'll kind of talk more focused about communities here in the United States and communities uh, even specifically here in Chicago and how they're being aided. So the first is really about, oh, there's a, I see there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm going to wait for this. Here we go. The first is really about uh, an organization called Mashav, and Mashav is the, um, the uh, humanitarian aid arm of the foreign ministry in Israel. Uh, they have been doing this for, you know, like you see here since 1958, working with um, developing countries around the world, helping them utilize the knowledge that Israel has gathered in energy and in agriculture uh, and in water pres uh, preservation to really help them grow their own economies. It's something that has started, it was the idea that came from David Ben-Gurion of how we need to be a light onto the nations, bring in our knowledge and helping other communities. Um, in recent years, in the last uh, about 20, 25 years, they've also worked with refugees, Jewish and non-Jewish refugees who have harbored, found way, their way into Israel helping them on the ground while they're still in that status uh, in Israel. And I, 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 I made a list, I found it on their website, it's gonna be here in a second, of really some of the items that are, are within the authority of Mashab. And you can see all the things that if you talk to people in Israel, um, people really care about. So food and education, medication, community development, um, and so on and so forth, really going and working with these communities and helping them find solutions to issues, utilizing that information that they have. Um, another arm of the Israeli government that has been tremendous around the world is the idea of search and rescue unit. Uh, again, a unit that has taken um, all the knowledge that Israel has gathered over uh, you know, its existence, basically, and is helping people all around the world. And you can see a whole big list here. Of course, we're not going to go into any, you know, all of them, but I wanted to highlight just a couple of them. One is 2005 and Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And I remember being in 2010, I was with a delegation of the Jewish Federations of North America working in New Orleans. And one person told me when we met there said, did you know that the IDF was on the ground in New Orleans before FEMA was on the ground in New Orleans. Just, just to imagine the situation that they've had to experience there, which is devastating. And I'm so glad that there were people on the ground helping them out of the, the wreckage that Katrina has created in New Orleans. Another thing that I wanted to highlight is all the way at the bottom, and you see two events that are happening actually on the Syrian border. Between 2016 and 2018, the IDF participated in what's called Operation Good Neighbor. That was in bringing in wounded Syrians into Israel uh, to seek medical care. And that happened for about two years during the civil war in Syria. Um, another event was in 2018. Uh, during the civil war in Syria, a very important group called the White Helmets was active in Syria fighting the regime, but also helping people who are wounded, people who are, uh, need medical care, who need to, be, to escape war zone. And in 2018, it was very clear that the Syrian regime has made a decision to rid, them, uh, rid Syria of them. They've decided they're all going to be caught and, and, and killed. And when that happened, using partners within Syria, international partners within, within Syria, all of them were smuggled into Israel and from Israel to other countries around the world, uh, and their lives were saved because of that. And, you know, we, uh, you know, again, growing up as an Israeli, to us, Syrians are the enemy. Um, Syrian people want the destruction of the state of Israel. That's what we've always known. There were wars. We learned about them in school. And really, during this period of the Syrian civil war, you really learn that things are not as, as they seem. And people to people, there's a lot that can be done. 
to build these relationships. And there's so many uh, work, that, so much work that has been done by Israelis, private citizens, to help the people of Syria during this devastating crisis that actually is still going on till this very day. Um, and uh, the war has been going on for, for um, 10 years now, um, on and off. So that, that's just a few words about what the Israeli government has been doing on an official basis to really spread a lot of the knowledge that they've gathered over the years. Um, but I think the highlight of Israeli aid, private aid around the world is an organization called Israel. Israel has been tremendous in assisting um, communities around the world uh, during events of crisis. And I, I wrote, I, I gave a few examples, since our focus is on communities in the United States, I gave a few examples uh, of events that happened in the United States, but of course their work is being done all over the world. Uh, they're very uh, active in Greece, helping refugees who are escaping Syria and trying to get into Europe through Greece. And they're very active there, helping uh, these people who are coming off, I wouldn't even call it boats. It's unbelievable that they have actually survived the, the passage to Greece. Um, but I really wanted to share some of some of these events. You know, if you look at this list, I'm sure that you're very much um, familiar with, um, with a lot of these unfortunate events. Um, and it, when I look, went on the website and look at some of the things that they've done, the, the very first thing you see here on the list was the, the one that caught me off guard. In a state like California, it's a very wealthy state, uh, with a lot of resources, there is an outside humanitarian aid organization, happened to be from Israel, who are assisting communities there with food relief, with food shortages in California, which was quite remarkable to me. And I'm very proud that Israel was able to be there and assist them in a, a very devastating time for the community. And we've seen that in Illinois as well, where some of these communities were devastated by food shortages. And we're gonna talk about that as well in a few minutes. But going through these lists, you see that they are really everywhere. Every time there is a crisis hitting um, countries around the world, and specifically here, the United States, we see this remarkable organization coming to people's assistance and helping them in the most devastating time in their lives which to me is quite remarkable. Um, and learning from them, and, and Israel is, is a consortium of organization. They're not just one organization and they bring a lot of resources, but really learning from the work that Israel has been doing around the world, I feel like a lot of other private Israeli organizations found the opportunity to uh, go and do good around the world. And this is a map, again, I found it on their website, and you can see how they're really all over the world helping with every possible crisis uh, that people are facing. Um, and this is uh, one, you know, we, we took some pictures. This is uh, Haiti um, in 2004, I believe. And uh, it's, it's, again, quite um, uh, after the, a major earthquake has hit Haiti and, and uh, following devastating events, the IDF and other private organizations were on the ground assisting the people of Haiti. And it's quite devastating to see that because Haiti never really recovered from these events. And to know that these people still need help till this very day, I'm happy to know that there are people who are still on the ground, again, not the IDF is not there anymore, but other private organizations are still on the ground assisting them um, in, in the challenges that they have seen since several major earthquakes have, um, have uh, happened to them. With that, I want to focus on other things and again, kind of go more into private organizations and what they do. And of course, those of you who know Israel, know that agriculture is a big part of Israeli society. Uh, making the desert bloom was the, uh, the message we all received very well from David Ben-Gurion, and his dream was also always that the real capital, the real financial capital of Israel would be Beersheba and the Negev. He always wanted the life to, to bloom in the Negev, and the experiences that we've learned from those attempts, very successful attempts, are what is helping Israelis now 
support other communities around the world who are having such difficult shortages. And of course, as global warming is affecting community, devastating communities around the world, it's good to have that knowledge about um, water desalination um, and with uh, growing um, vegetables in, in desert areas. And you know, the biggest challenge is, is water. And as you know, um, water is an issue that everyone around the world is facing from California to, um, you know, to, to Israel, to other uh, communities in Africa and so on and so forth. And there are a lot of solutions to water shortages that exist. And I'm sure all you need to do is a quick Google search and you find a whole list. But one that I found the most exciting is this one right here, WaterGen. I wanna show you, uh, I don't know if you know this guy, his name is Nas Daly. He has a whole set of videos online on Facebook and on YouTube, you should check him out. He's quite an impressive person. Uh, but I wanted to show you a very short clip from, from one of these videos. Guys, check out this machine. It is from the future. This machine turns air into water. I kid you not, from the back, this sucks in the air around us. And from the front, you click here and it turns it into water. This is crazy. Water from air. Before I tell you how this machine works, wow, this is good. I gotta tell you about the water problem. In the world, billions of people to this day live without clean water. Their water is either too polluted, too salty, or too little. And if we continue like this, we may run out of drinkable water. But what if we can create more drinkable water? Well, that is the question these guys are trying to answer. A group of researchers in Israel built technology that could solve the drinkable water problem. Hi, my name is Michael, and we found a way to create water from air. See, the air around us is made up of two things, air molecules and water molecules. You can't see them with your eye, but you can feel them when the water is a little bit humid. In an average room like this one, there are water molecules floating in the air. And if we capture them, we can make a few liters of water. So imagine how much water we can make from the air outside. A lot of it. So we build a machine to collect water from the air around us. This machine takes in humid air and then it cleans it. Then it condenses it into water. From there, the machine adds minerals to the water, makes it colder and then Ta-da! You get real, drinkable, chilled water. All you need is air and electricity to make this work. So I want to tell you, oh, sorry about that. I want to tell you a really quick story. So when I was um, a bit younger, I know Mark said I'm pretty old at this point. Um, when I was a bit younger, before I moved to the States, I came to visit and I stayed, oh, here we go. I stayed with a family member in New Jersey. God. And she was, um, I remember it very vividly, just to, you, probably only someone from Israel can have that uh, thought in mind. So I, um, she was doing the dishes and she was standing in the sink and doing her dishes, the water's running, and then she got into an argument with her dad. And she walks away from the sink and she fights with him. I, it doesn't matter, I don't even know what it was. The water is running. And I felt like someone just punched me in the face. I screamed, what are you doing? Turn the water off. Why am I telling you this ridiculous story? Because I feel like this kind of invention can only come from a place where people have a constant fear of running out of water. This is probably not something that you, you would see in a New Jersey company or a Chicago company make, because it comes from the thought of, what if we run out? Where's the next batch of water that we're gonna get to drink from the air? Um, and, and WaterGen is doing incredible work around the world. They're bringing their machines 
to uh, areas that are uh, destroyed uh, with, uh, because of, of climate change and they're not able to really supply clean water to their community. But one event that I wanted to show you that Stamilus was actually involved in, we helped connect Navajo Nation in Arizona with WaterGen. Navajo Nation has uh, experienced severe drought for, for several years now, has, as has the entire Southwest of the United States. Uh, and they've come to a point where they have no usable drinking water. And they've had people driving tanks back and forth, back and forth to supply water for the community. It's expensive, it's difficult, it's time consuming. And we said, what if we brought the water to you? Now, given, I don't know how much water is in the air in Arizona, I can't commit to that, but enough that WaterGen is now supplying water, free water, to the community at, at, in Arizona, to Navajo Nation. So something like that is not just impacting a community that's able to drink water. It's impacting them financially because they're not wasting time and money on bringing water from elsewhere. They can now have local water and spend that time on doing any other thing that uh, the community needs to do. So that is an economical change for the community and really affecting how the community is changing the way they're doing things, the way they've done things for a very long time, trying to gather water resources from elsewhere. Um, and, and this is one of the first projects that Stand With Us has done with WaterGen. Uh, since then, we've been working with them on other projects on bringing usable water to other communities in the United States and in Central America as well. Another uh, place where you know, take a second. Another place where WaterGen was very, very important uh, is in Flint. And I, I assume everyone here knows how terrible the situation has been in Flint, Michigan, for a very long time now. There's been a lot of empty promises to fix the problem, but in fact, they haven't. And people there still are drinking only bottled water. Uh, and it's a huge challenge for a community. It's a, it's already a community that has financial challenges and to not be able to have clean running water is something that's absolutely devastating for that community. And so WaterGen um, is bringing their machines to um, um, Flint, Michigan. There are several machines there right now. This gentleman here is called Armstrong Williams. He's the owner of the NBC, local NBC station in Flint. And he brought the first one, that was in 2019, he brought the first machine to a church in Flint, Michigan um, to help solve that problem that is still very much in existence. Um, so it's another reason why a, a, a community that already has such difficult challenges, even without water shortage, is being impacted and how we can really solve a lot of their issues by bringing running water. Another uh, case study, another uh, story I wanted to share with you that Stavodas has been involved with is right here in Chicago. This is in Inglewood on the south side. Uh, there is, uh, as I'm sure again, everyone in this room and online know, it's a very big challenge that the community has with violence. Gag violence shooting um, that has been huge and devastating to that community. Um, one thing that we've learned is that local religious leaders are trying to fix that problem uh, by offering employment opportunities, believing that if people have employment, if they have education and employment, then they won't join the gangs, they'll do um, better things with their lives. And so one pastor that we've worked with, his name is Pastor Corey Brooks. Some of you might know him, he's the rooftop, known as the rooftop pastor, uh, created Project Hood. And Project Hood, his main goal is to build this community center. It's not fully built yet, this is a, uh, a picture. Um, and um, one thing that we said is, what is the biggest shortage that we can help you with? And we learned that uh, alongside being having many challenges with violence, the South Side also, is also a food desert. It's very difficult to find fresh produce on the South Side. Some organizations are bringing literally buses where people can go and shop in the bus. Some people have to you know, travel into the, into the downtown area or into the city to buy fresh produce. And we said, what if we could, you know, kill two birds in one stone? What if we could bring fresh produce to the South Side and also offer employment opportunities? 
And we've partnered with an organization called Live in Green. And Live in Green is an Israeli company that builds urban gardens. Uh, they build it inside buildings, outside buildings. They could be completely attached to the walls. You can create a whole space inside your building or build a greenhouse inside the building. And these are examples. They're not from uh, Chicago because we're still in the process of finishing the project there. This is from uh, one of their Tel Aviv greenhouses. And as you can see, there is no usage of um, sunlight. It's inside a building. There's no usage of uh, dirt uh, for this. They're really building these um, urban gardens. And those urban gardens are going to be utilized with Project Food on the south side. Again, bringing not only uh, food solutions, but also opportunities, employment opportunities, because people are going to be working in those gardens creating, bringing in the produce and then selling it. So offering employment and education to the people on the South side. And we're really hopeful that that's gonna be one of several projects that we're gonna do with Living Green in the Chicago area. Uh, we're working with the city of Chicago and the Israeli consulate to bring these opportunities to the community on the South side. One last thing I wanted to share with you and then we'll go to the Q&A part of the program. Um, is an issue, I don't know if you, got, you guys can read the, uh, the very top, but a major issue, and, and um, you know, we mentioned a little bit, is that one thing that Israelis know is uh, wartime and violence, and something that has devastated and affected the Israelis since the establishment of the State of Israel. Well, one result of that is post-trauma. And as someone who has family who lives uh, on the south part of Israel, who's been affected by rockets for many, many years, I know the effect that post-trauma has on children and adults, as many Israelis do. And organizations in Israel found ways to address post-trauma, see it, understand it, and treat it, but also create public awareness. Because the, I think one of the biggest problems with addressing post-trauma is people's fear of, of being stigmatized, of having those issues. Uh, so public awareness is a big part of doing that work. Um, and one organization called Natal, um, which is a very well-known organization, an organization in Israel has been uh, significant in a lot of the work of addressing trauma and post-trauma, um, has actually joined hands with uh, pastors on the South side. And I wanna share another uh, short video with you to kind of give you a little bit of, of showing you what they're doing. Israel. While there, he noticed the similarities suffered by those in war-torn areas and those living in some areas of Chicago. Pastor Harris sought assistance from an Israeli organization called Natal. Now together, they're working to help Chicagoans. Many Chicagoans may balk at the comparison of our city to a war zone. In Israel, they have to worry about missiles. But in Chicago, we're daily counting body bags and tow tags gunshot wounds and they're going in too. The yeah. Chicago pastor Chris Harris saw some striking similarities when he visited Tel Aviv in 2012. I was in the Holy Land. I believe that this was God revealing to me an assignment that I should take on in my life. While there, he discovered an organization called Natal. It's a trauma center established to treat victims of terror and war suffering from post-traumatic stress. The light bulb really went off in my head saying, if the people in Israel, in this war-torn area, who suffer from PTSD, come to this place for post-trauma counseling, could we not bring this model to Chicago? Last February, 12 clinical psychologists traveled from Natal in Israel to Chicago and trained Harris and other pastors on how to treat those in their communities suffering from trauma. Harris says the staggering numbers of shootings and killings in Chicago leave people in trauma and pain, but many don't seek professional counseling. And so, of course, this is something that I wish, you know, we never had to address here in Chicago, but we know the effect that, uh, you know, gang violence and shooting has had on, has had on the, on the, on the Chicago community on the South side. Um, and I've been to, um, I'm going to turn this down so there's not, no, 
I've been to um, the Pastor Harris, for those who don't know, he a, has a very large church, Bright Star, in Bronzeville uh, on the south side. And I visited his church as well as um, Pastor Brooks' church. In, and really, we see this grassroots attempt of community leaders to fill a, a, a big issue that the community has, addressing trauma, addressing violence in ways that are different than anything we've tried before. And I'm very proud that there are Israelis who are helping these communities step away from these challenges that they've had for many, many years using the unfortunate experience that they've had themselves. Um, and that's something that's very significant in the work that these organizations are doing. So what we hope to do at Stand With Us is, A, we wanna hope to strengthen this relationship between Israel and Israelis and the Chicago community and the need that they have across the spectrum in many, many of the, of the uh, items that you saw today, but also in other uh, issues that the community has. We wanna make sure that we provide opportunities for community on the South side to work with the Jewish community here in Chicago. We have the connections in Israel. We have the knowledge right here. We are able to assist them. They might not even know that it exists. And I hope to strengthen that collaboration that we have, just like the ones that we have with Pastor Brooks um, when Project Hood and Pastor Harris. Um, and also, like I said, helping them identify they need, their need. They might not know exactly how to know where the solution is, what the need is, and perhaps we, together with our community, has the ability to help them. So I'm very hopeful that using the, the work that these organizations are doing, we can strengthen the collaboration that uh, the Jewish community here and the community on the south side of Chicago has. So I appreciate everyone's time and the opportunity to speak with you this evening. And with that, um, let's take some questions. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Does anybody? Oh, I'm not sorry. Let's see, we can already uh, have some questions. No. Okay. Does anybody have any questions from home? Anybody have any questions here in the audience? We can start with that, please. Since there's it's an emerging technology and the problem. Try to speak up because oh. of the microphone. Oh. The microphone. Oh, oh, yeah. Here, I'll bring it just a thought, since it's such an emerging technology and you have just the long side of Israel, at least in the West Bank, Palestinians who have severe water problems, wouldn't that be applied to relieve some of their burden too? Well, yeah. Well, answer that. Yeah. So that is a great question. So obviously today we focus more on the work that's being done uh, here in the United States. But in fact, there is, uh, quite a large collaboration happening between civil society organizations, aside from you know, any work that's being done, and there is work on the ground that's being done directly with the IDF and uh, the Palestinian Authority and their forces. Uh, but civil society, private organizations, there is a lot of collaboration uh, uh, happening, being, hap being uh, done on the ground in the Palestinian Authority. And so where there are different shortages and challenges, uh, it's being addressed from time to time. Of course, the political situation, as we know, is quite fluid over there, uh, so to, to um, say the most. And so um, I'm not sure you know, when that collaboration happens and when it, it stops. But in general, or generally speaking, I know of several local organizations that are working in collaboration with Palestinian civil society organizations. As a matter of fact, so, like some water for the in Gaza. so the in, in Gaza, the situation is where they receive most of these resources from the Israeli government. So fresh water, um, fuel for power stations, and and uh, uh, so on and so forth. That comes from from Israel. Uh, just because of the situation that they're in. Uh, any other questions here in the audience? It's on, um, are we going to be hearing more about these efforts on the post-trauma um, 
counseling and, and development because obviously, you know, we read a lot about not only the violence, but what the violence causes with the you know, PTSD of people and retaliation and all the rest that's going on. So this seems to me to be one of the most important things that could be done in those communities. And, uh, and uh, should we expect to be hearing more about that? Thank you. So I, I truly hope so. And uh, one thing that we can do is you know, reach out to Pastor Harris and you know, Becky, we can also be in touch and see if there's an opportunity to, to do something together with them. Um, I would really want to, uh, as someone who's lived in Chicago for the past 10 years, but many of you have been here um, longer, you know the, the situation on the South Side. It's been going on forever. Uh, and so it's about time that it's, it's been addressed. And again, I'm happy that local leaders are taking um, the initiative, um, but a lot of the work is being done behind the scenes. So Natal, you saw in that video, they sent uh, trainers to train staff uh, at Bright Star Church uh, to help on the ground on a daily basis. Uh, but there is still exchange happening and there is ongoing training happening. So I think that the community still need a lot of training and a lot of resources. And of course, this is an ongoing situation on the South side. Um, I know that this past week, there was a group of, it wasn't in the presentation, but there was a group of uh, first responders from Magen David Adom, from the Israeli Red Cross, uh, here in Chicago, providing training for the Latino community. Um, so again, this, you know, this is an ongoing situation. And I would love to continue the conversation on this, find an opportunity to maybe present more about this, maybe in collaboration with, with Bright Star Church. Uh, oh, great. Thanks, Asa. I think that the idea of helping other countries definitely helps address anti-Semitism because it puts you know a good face out there. It shows that we're helping. You know, it shows other people that we're we're good people and we don't you know deserve hate. But I wonder, do you have any specific examples of how this technology and innovation has specifically decreased anti-Semitism, or if you have any stories or anything like that? So I, I will say I. I don't think that these acts are, are being done with the intention of, of an after effect of, of decreasing anti-Semitism. Um, I think that these are, you know, people who are, it's something that's really important to them and they, they want to see the impact that they can have on other communities. I can tell you that, for example, um, we, uh, working with the Navajo Nation, they didn't really know much about Israel. And what they did know was not necessarily uh, positive, things that they've heard from the media and so on and so forth. And so for that's an example of a community who, when they really had to experience Israel firsthand, it was a very positive experience. And again, I'll say, you know, no one said, you know, you get the water, you got to, you know, love Israel. That's not, that's not where anyone's intentions are. I truly hope that these uh, uh, events around the world truly change people's perspective of Israel. Um, I really believe that we can make a difference in people's perspective of Israel. So if, if and that's, I think that is a great way to do that, to support Israel and, and support these communities in their dire need. How else might we support the work of stand with us and also in um, helping publicize it because I'm sure many people have no idea uh, what your group is doing and as well as all these other groups. Thank you. So stand with us as is a relatively young organization. We've been around for 21 years. Uh, originally started in Los Angeles and we've been in the Chicago area for about 12 years now. Um, our work is mostly fo focused on students, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and on college campuses as well, uh, with the, uh, the need to support these students as they face anti-Semitism on campus. And I'm sure many of you know, uh, the situation on campus has gone from bad to worse 
uh, as far as anti-Semitism over the, the last few years. Um, one thing I say to people when they ask is, a great way to spread the word is to know yourself what is being done. Uh, Stand With Us is a leader on social media. Uh, we are, are um, reach on social media through Facebook and Instagram and other apps that I don't even know. Again, you know, Mark, tell me how old I am. Uh, I don't even know some of these apps, but we have an incredible team who does and work with young people. Um, we um, really um, reach hundreds of millions of people, sometimes on a weekly basis, with the content we put out there. Uh, we have a newsletter that goes out every week, and it mostly promotes work that's being done around the world. Um, and we really want people to learn more about this. As I said, we're very active in the Chicago area. We work with communities uh, on the South Side, but also in other areas in the Midwest and around the country. Um, and I, I know I, I will leave, you know, Mark has my information and we can share it with the community. I'll leave some information here as well. Would love to be in touch with people if they have more thoughts and ideas. First, compared to me, you still are a young man. Yeah. But beside that, and thanking Seymour Lipton, who I should have thanked at the start for arranging this program, um, could I impose on your high school leader to comment a little more on the work she's doing? Yeah, so um, I, Haley uh, here is not only an Evansonian, uh, she works uh, in our high school department. Of course, I planted her in the crowd to make me look good. Uh, I will also mention Andrea here, Works in our middle school department. Um, but yeah, Haley, share, share a few things about our work in high school. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a couple of different initiatives, uh, programs that we do in high schools. So our biggest one is the Kenneth Leventhal internship, and that's a, a regional internship. So I manage the Midwest region, I have 13 states, and in those 13 states, I have 16 interns this year. Those interns um, get to go to LA twice a year for conferences where they learn about combating anti-Semitism, navigating difficult conversations on social media, in person, obviously learning about Israel as well. And then throughout the year, we have one-on-one -on -one mentorship meetings, professional mentorship, as well as educational mentorship, um, continued education seminars. And then they have to put on a minimum of four programs a year. So I have a student in Deerfield who just put on a program at his school where oh, uh, 98 students showed up. Um, and this was an Israel trivia night, um, these programs could be anything. They could be a game night, they could be bringing in a, a speaker. We have a, a miniature version called TLC, which is the Teen Leadership Council. This is for all high school students. Uh, they can apply um, if you go to our website and look at Teen Leadership Council. If you guys have children or grandchildren in high school, um, they get the monthly meetings as well with one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship as well as continued education, and they put on a program. In addition to that, schools can bring us in if there's an incident. We can come in and do education. Um, we, we do programming at synagogues, at youth centers, uh, youth groups. Yeah, and then Andrea so from. Andrea, Andrea, do you want to say something? Go ahead, Andrea. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I wanted to say when um, Haley was saying there were 98 students, I was hearing my mother in my head saying, why not 100? <laughs> that's, that's just me. Hi, I'm Andrea Nyman. I'm with Israel Link. And we pretty much just do one main program, which is providing Israel education to middle school students. And we pride ourselves very much on the types of technology we use and making sure that it's really engaging at the middle school level. Um, I think it's really important to develop an not only an awareness, but developing, making students feel that Israel is important to them in their own way at a young age so that they can continue their involvement in their education. So once they get to college or you know when they see these incidents that they have that strong foundation in that education so that they know you know to, to either take action or to know that this is wrong you know what's going on so it's definitely super important to start early um, and you know inspire people to connect to Israel throughout their whole lives oh, I thank you um, I but I just wanted to say all this information is available on our website, standwithus.com. Uh, so, you know, you can find a lot of information on our programs available for all age groups. Uh, and also to say that I wanted to uh, recognize Seymour here as well, who's been a longtime supporter of Stand With Us. So I appreciate 
Uh, I appreciate you, Seymour, for, for being here tonight and for uh, being with us. And I also wanted to say before I, I give you a part for another question, is that our annual event um, is November 6th, and we have exciting speakers. We have Noah Tishby, uh, who's uh, the only Hollywood persona I know. She's a producer and an actress, um, and she also is an activist uh, in fighting combating anti-Semitism. And also the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Gilad Erdan, is also going to be there and speak. So I'll share some information with the committee and feel free to share it with people. It'll be November 6th, and it's going to be at the Lincolnshire Marriott. So you have a question. Uh, I guess I, I was just wondering, are there what, a two, are there um, other organizations like Stand With Us that are doing similar work? And if so, or, or, and secondly, how many organizations like from Israel are there? And just so in, you know, like a general sense, is there you know, the scope of 5, 10, 15, or that kind of number? So there, you know, there are quite a few organizations here in the Chicago area who focus on anti-Semitism and on Israel. Uh, what I, you know, what's put Stand With Us aside is our focus on education. Uh, like you heard from Andrea and, and uh, Haley, we try to focus on the students and give them the tools that they need. Other organizations obviously work uh, with uh, other communities, uh, again, here in the Chicago area, and everything on the ABC soup uh, is available from, from, uh, from the ADL to the AJC uh, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and many of them are active here in the Chicago area. Um, how many Israeli organizations? I, I can't say, give you a number, but I can tell you that there's a lot of them. Um, many of them work within these consortiums, um, like Israel Aid, where they will direct them where their specific assistance is needed. But when I was doing the research um, for this presentation, I came across a very long list of organizations. Um, there are a lot of people working around the world. I chose these because of the work they do here in the United States and in the Chicago area. But there's a very large number of organizations. I found organi Israeli organizations run by Israelis who are right now in Syria running field hospitals. And of course, they're not telling them where they're from. They're not telling them who they are. Uh, but they're on the ground in Syria treating people. Um, so there are really Israelis doing this incredible work all over the world, sometimes without getting the recognition that I, I believe they deserve, but of course, given the situation, they might not be able to get it. Thank you very much. Uh, looks like we haven't seen any questions from home. Anybody have any questions from home? No? So um, thanks a lot. I think it's great that we have, you know, we, we try to have a diverse program. We bring in different people. When we get somebody who comes in to talk about all the negative stuff about Israel, we get a lot of people in here. And when we, when we want to talk about the positive parts of Israel, we end up with a pretty sparse room. So it's really nice to have you, and it's really nice to say something positive about Israel, because people do like to sort of pull out the, the threads they can find about negativity, and it's good to talk about the more positive things. So anybody else in the room have anything you want to say? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. It's incredible. It's rewarding. It's challenging. Yeah. Yeah.
think high school is a fun age group. They have lots of ideas and opinions. And but they're also an idealist. Yes. The, the passion and the, some of the ideas. Yeah. Um, yep, I've got someone at Jones right now. Um, I want all of the flashing uh, moments to be great. Uh, even more if I could. Uh, yeah, as many as I can. So you guys have any teenagers in your life? Oh, I got a house? No, three times. No, it's the mansion. Yeah. One on one, me and Paul. 